Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone had a safe and happy new year. Today we'll have our usual modeling and health updates, which will include the latest information on the vaccine. As you'll hear in more detail in a few minutes, we're seeing some concerning trends across New England, New York, and Quebec, where we had over 170,000 new cases over the holidays. These numbers alone are troubling, but it's not just the cases, because positivity rates in our neighboring states are on the rise as well. While we're seeing something similar, but not on a much smaller scale here in Vermont, it's too early to know exactly what our recent cases mean or the impact of the last 10 days. With this in mind, we want to encourage Vermonters to get tested coming out of the holidays. We've been working to build up uh, available testing, and we hope you'll take advantage of it so we can find cases and stop them in their tracks. Like many Vermonters, I was happy to ring in the new year and put 2020 in the rearview mirror, but clearly we still have much more to do as we work to get vaccines distributed to more Vermonters. I know this continues to be hard, but let's remember why we're doing this, to save lives. Every day we're seeing more Vermonters lost to this virus. When I get the report early each morning and I see two, four, five deaths listed, I feel the responsibility squarely on my shoulders and I take each one of them personally. We know from experience, from the data and science that those who are older and others with serious underlying chronic conditions are far more vulnerable to serious long-term health issues and unfortunately even death from COVID. And that's exactly why our public health strategies are focused on them. They are who we should all be thinking about when deciding whether to wear a mask, physically distance, or put social plans on hold. And I know it's been difficult and it's inconvenient but we're trying to prevent people from pain and suffering and even death by limiting the spread of the virus. This is the thinking that's gone into our plan to prioritize vaccines by age and health conditions. Last summer and into the fall, we went months without a single death as a result of COVID. And new cases were regularly in the single digits. But unfortunately, over the last month, we rarely go a day without someone dying because of this virus. So as we prioritize the distribution of a very limited supply of vaccines, we're focused on saving lives. This means older Vermonters living in nursing homes, assisted living facilities, and in their own homes get the vaccine first, along with those who provide them with direct care. I know we all want to get back to as close to normal as possible. And we also know the vaccine is the best and quickest way to get there. But it's going to take some time to get enough supply from the federal government to get everyone vaccinated. So until that time comes, we're asking you to be patient with us, with each other, and with the health measures in place. As well, we're asking you to be compassionate our guidance has a proven track record when it comes to mitigating the spread of this virus, but it only works if we continue to follow it. You've been doing this for so long out of empathy for one another and for the more vulnerable members of our communities. So if we stick to what we know works along with the vaccination plan, I'm confident we'll come out of this pandemic stronger and healthier than any other state in the country. With that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Pichek for our modeling update. Uh, thank you, Governor Scott, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I wanna again reiterate uh, the uncertainty that exists with COVID data around the holidays. Uh, as we saw with Thanksgiving, Holidays can impact testing of asymptomatic individuals as they're less likely to seek out a test. Uh, some states may even have fewer testing options available, 
uh, and some states may have delays in the processing and the reporting of their cases. In addition, as the governor mentioned, uncertainty around our data uh, is one part, but also uh, it's too early to know the full impact of the holidays uh, and those who may have gathered uh, or traveled during this period. Uh, we're now 11 days from the Christmas holiday, but we need a little bit more time to understand the potential impact of that event, plus another 10 days or so to see the full impact from New Year's Eve as well. So we'll need to keep this in mind uh, and avoid making conclusions until the data becomes more certain. This week uh, delivers us another grim milestone. As of Sunday, over 350,000 Americans have lost their lives to the virus. Americans are also dying more often as we've lost an additional 50,000 citizens in just the last 21 days, the fastest pace the country has experienced to date. Looking at our regional data, we also have some reason for concern, as the governor mentioned. This week, the Northeast is reporting over 175,000 cases, a 20% increase in cases from last week, and a total that far exceeds any previous week during the pandemic. Further, uh, even though cases went up over the past week, uh, regional testing went down. In fact, since, Christmas, uh, since the Christmas holiday, testing in the Northeast is down about 14%. With cases up and testing down, this has caused the regional positivity rate to increase to over 10%, about double the rate that's recommended by the World Health Organization. Similarly, hospitalizations across the region are high and trending higher. The 12,656 individuals that are currently hospitalized in the Northeast represent a 13% increase from the Christmas holiday and an 85% increase from December 1st. Now looking at travel into Vermont, uh, we now have data through the end of the year, which indicates that out-of-state travel is down approximately 50% compared to last year's holiday period. However, it also shows that this is the highest volume of out-of-state visitors to Vermont since the pandemic has begun. Today, Vermont will also report its 8,000th case since the start of the pandemic with the state adding an additional 1,000 cases over the past 10 days. And as we start the new year, we are seeing that our case growth has increased over the past week. We were averaging about 83 cases a week ago. That has increased to 106 cases yesterday and 117 cases as of today. Again, those are on a seven-day average. Uh, but it's important for us not to draw any conclusions until we receive more case data and more reliable information from the region around us. Like our region, Vermont has also seen our seven-day test average decline, although not as significantly, and our positivity rate increase over the ho holiday period. However, our rate remains much lower than the region, standing at 2.63%. Turning to our regional heat map, you can see that Vermont continues to stand out in the region in terms of low case counts. However, it's also important to note that our southernmost counties have also seen higher cases in the recent weeks. Turning to our Vermont forecast, you know, due to the uncertainty that we have discussed, uh, this week we're not showing a case trend forecast, but rather a range of outcomes. Uh, one trend line assumes there's no holiday-related increase in cases, and Vermont's trend remains flat. The other trend assumes Vermont experiences an increase in cases connected to the holidays that is consistent with the increase other states experienced after the Thanksgiving holiday. Again, it's too early to know which trajectory we are on, but we will be closely monitoring this uh, over the days and weeks ahead. However, we remain confident that even if Vermont does see an increase in cases from the holidays, that our hospitals will have the necessary resources to tend to everyone who needs care. The two forecasts here assume an increase in cases from the holidays, and for both medical surgical beds and for ICU beds, we remain safely under our statewide hospital capacity, even if this holiday forecast comes about. Also, although the past few months certainly have been challenging here in Vermont, it's important for Vermonters to remember that your sacrifices that you're making are still having a really big impact. When we measure our pandemic response ac across key metrics, Vermont remains in the top one or two states in the country. 
which is really a continuing testament to the hard work and dedication of Vermonters and their willingness to sacrifice. We're also seeing Vermont uh, stand out on the pace of vaccine administration. New data released yesterday by the CDC ranks Vermont first in the Northeast on doses administered per 100,000 residents, and we're second in the entire region, only behind West Virginia. Turning now to the weekly updates on long-term care uh, and K through 12 education, Vermont's long-term care facilities uh, saw the case totals this week stand at 451. That's down from 513 last week with new cases in long-term care facilities staying at a relatively low level. So we certainly wanna hope this trend continues. Across Northern New England, there were 460 new K through 12 cases with most of those cases coming from New Hampshire and Maine. Vermont only had 10 cases reported, but of course we must remember that most schools have been out of session for the holidays as well. Last, regarding uh, flu vaccination, Vermont has now surpassed the number of individuals vaccinated during last year's flu season, and we are at 83% of the way toward our goal for this season. So again, if you haven't done so already, make a plan to stop by your local pharmacy and get your flu shot. And with that, I'll now turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you. I hope everybody had a happy and safe start to their new year. Through the New Year's weekend, our seven-day case average was 106 cases. Last evening, though, our lab reported out 165 cases, and sadly, we recorded five more deaths, bringing the total lives lost in our state to 149. It's difficult to draw definitive conclusions yet regarding the holidays, as Christmas and New Year's likely did have an impact on both testing availability and the reporting of results. However, our EPI team is beginning to gain knowledge of some holiday gatherings. There are still many more cases that do not have this theme. Any potential spikes would likely appear in the coming week or so. I expect to have a more thorough analysis of this on Friday after several more days of data. But the most important thing I want to impress on people at this time is to get tested. <clears throat> Whether you gathered with a single household, whether you broke the rules and saw more people over the holidays, or if you had a potential exposure to someone who uh, has been shown to have COVID, please get tested. There's still time to protect our loved ones and our communities. Remember, this virus spreads easily from person to person, and you can spread the virus even when you don't have any symptoms. Testing is really the only way we have to exercise what we are calling our containment strategy and make that an effective strategy. It's how we make sure that everyone who tests positive can then isolate and identify their close contacts so they can stay home and away from other people. <clears throat> One important note that I'd like to make the other part of an effective containment strategy is knowing who you were in close contact with. That means, of course, within six feet for a total of 15 minutes or more over a 24-hour period. So if you gathered with people or did not follow protocols, please know that contact tracers don't enforce rules and you're not going to get into trouble. The key is to make sure we have the information that we need to protect Vermonters. Testing and tracing can really stop the virus in its tracks, but only when we know who has it. And as you saw in Commissioner Pichak's slides, our region is experiencing further increases in new active cases, though Vermont continues to fare better than the other states. The more we can test now, and the more we can then prevent the virus from being transmitted from one unsuspecting Vermonter to another, the more we can reduce the activity of the virus in our state, while at the same time providing more and more doses of vaccine to Vermonters over the winter and spring. 
starting out at a lower level of virus while vaccination is ramping up is part of an important strategy for returning as nearly as possible to life as it was before COVID-19. The good news is that Vermonters without COVID symptoms can now get tested at more than 15 regular locations throughout the state, and more of them are now open every day. Many sites now allow you to take your sample yourself using a short swab in your nose. So it's really very quick, it's easy, and it's free. You can register for a test by visiting healthvermont.gov slash COVID-19 testing. You do have to create an account to register, and we appreciate your patience with this process. If you do have symptoms of COVID-19, please contact your health care provider so they can refer you for testing. If you don't have one, you can call 211. And remember that a test only tells you if you have COVID-19 at the time you were tested. So keep up the basics, wearing a mask, keeping at least six feet apart from one another, washing hands, and staying home when you're sick. <clears throat> now we continue to hear a lot in the news about new variant of COVID-19 virus most notably one that first emerged in the United Kingdom, but has since been detected in numerous countries around the world, including the United States. Just to summarize, the variant seems to spread more easily and quickly, but currently there's no evidence that it causes any more severe illness or greater risk of death. Should it increase in prevalence in the U.S., it will mean we have to redouble our efforts to keep distanced and masked, and that more of the population may be impacted and need medical care. Also, it will mean more of the population will need to be vaccinated. Now, we have not seen this, Vermont, this variant in Vermont yet. I fully expect we will, especially in light of the news of yesterday, of a case in Saratoga Springs, New York. We will be regularly sending samples to the CDC to determine their genetic sequence. And the first of these were already sent several weeks ago. On the vaccine front, our hospitals continue to vaccinate frontline healthcare workers, those who treat or are likely to be exposed to patients with COVID-19, both within and outside of their walls. Vermont is doing very well in getting vaccine into the arms of its healthcare workforce with a quick turnaround from when the vaccine reaches the state. CDC over the weekend had our state ranked seventh in the country for the percentage of doses administered. And on our uh, dashboard today, we are showing 17,653 doses administered with almost half of our EMS workforce vaccinated and a quarter of the healthcare workers. This week will mark the first group of individuals who are actually getting their second dose. And the pharmacy partners continue to vaccinate residents and staff who have patient contact in long-term care facilities at an accelerated pace. <clears throat> Vermont's Vaccine Implementation Advisory Committee has now provided me with its recommendations for the next phase of vaccination. And they concur with an initial age banding prioritization to help our major goal of saving lives and reducing severe illness. First, individuals age 75 and older, then ages 65 to 74, followed by people in a younger age range who have higher risk conditions. We're working with the committee to further define these conditions but as I've said before, they, those conditions will almost certainly include heart diseases, emphysema or COPD, chronic kidney disease, cancer, and immunosuppressive states like organ donation uh, pe people. More details will follow at a later press conference as we do not expect we'll get to these groups until later this month at the earliest and of course, depending upon federal allocation of vaccine to Vermont. In the meantime though, please don't call or write us to get yourself or your loved ones on the list. 
Please know that experts on the advisory committee, public health and government leaders are doing their utmost to take all the risk, ethical and logistical factors into account when making these decisions on how best to allocate the so far limited supplies of vaccine we're receiving. Vermonters will know when it's your turn to step up for the vaccine. One more note about the vaccine. In the last few days, amid concerns about this new variant and the slow pace of states getting vaccine into people, and the news that Great Britain has plans to get one dose of vaccine into its entire population and administer the second dose whenever it can, possibly many months later. There's a discussion um, about doing something similar in the U.S. as well. This came and was precipitated by several well-known academic physicians in an op-ed in the Washington Post. Opponents of such a change, however, say that the U.S. problem is really one of deployment by an overstressed healthcare workforce, and that requires a separate solution. Experts who hold the opposite opinion to not do what Great Britain is doing include Dr. Fauci and the FDA commissioner. I subscribe to that line of reasoning, which is essentially that this would be off-label use, a protocol that none of the studies have looked into and which potentially undermines the efficacy of the vaccine, since we know little about only one dose as a strategy. For now, please remember, if you receive the first dose of the vaccine, you're not immediately immune or protected. It may take seven or 10 days to develop some immune response, which may not be overall adequate to fend off the virus completely. You will still need a second shot in three or four weeks, depending on which mRNA vaccine you received, and then another seven to 10 day waiting period to develop full immune response. That's a total of six, seven, eight or more weeks. So keep that in mind. One shot and you're not immune that day. And for those who say, what about this new more infectious strain? Well, we still have defenses against it. If we can just muster the ongoing energy to continue distancing, masking, and avoiding crowded indoor spaces. I'll turn it back to the governor. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Uh, we'll now open it up to questions. We'll start with Calvin. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Governor. So as you know, uh, the legislative session kicks off tomorrow, um, almost certainly going to be defined by the pandemic and economic recovery. Um, what, are, what are some of your top priorities uh, and what, what are you looking at maybe policy-wise specifically? Yeah, I'm, there will be a lot of surprises, but, uh, but I'd advocate for everyone to tune in on Thursday night to learn more when I'll be uh, addressing Vermont. Um, I've had a uh, meeting with legislative leaders, uh, the um, pro tem elect, uh, as well as the speaker elect, or we presume to be uh, speaker and pro tem, and a very productive uh, meeting, and uh, I look forward to working with them. So. Again, uh, there won't be a lot of surprises, but uh, we're all focused on the same thing. So I thought it was a, it was a good first start. And uh, over the weekend, we, we heard a, a pretty remarkable call uh, from the president regarding um, election results in Georgia. And at the same time, we're also hearing about some Republicans in, in Congress that are planning to uh, vote against um, certifying President-elect Biden. Um, I'm just kind of wondering what, what your thoughts are and what's happening in Washington right now yeah, in the political it's, sphere. You know, a very dangerous partisan game that's being played um, and further dividing Americans, which is exactly what we do, do not need at this point in time. Uh, we need to come together. Uh, we need to put the election behind us and work toward common goals. So uh, I, uh, I applaud those, especially uh, the leaders and Republican leaders in Georgia who have uh, said that this was a, a fair and just election, and they're standing by that uh, through, uh, through and experiencing uh, a lot of uh, pushback, uh, both from the Trump administration, but as well as from everyday um, 
uh, citizens. So, um, you know, it's a tough place for them to be, but they're doing the right thing. Uh, and you have to, uh, to be honest and transparent and, uh, and make sure that uh, there's a fair process in place, which they've done. So I, I respect them for that. Just have one last quick follow-up for Dr. Levine. Uh, Dr., you mentioned that we have, we've administered a little over 17,000 doses uh, administered. I'm wondering, what's the total number, uh, as of today, the total number of vaccines that we've received so far? And maybe if you consider putting that on the dashboard as well going forward. If you give me a second, I can give you that number, because that number is actually on the dashboard. I'm probably going to have to not waste my time up here getting it for you, but it's on there. But um, it's important to note, um, as the CDC and others make these calculations as to how well is the state doing, um, doses come in at unpredictable times, uh, and clinics are scheduled, sometimes canceled, because doses didn't arrive when they need to arrive. Um, and it's a lot more accurate to think of the doses that arrived within a given week uh, and then you finish that week um, to figure out a numerator or a denominator that would make sense. The um, number of doses that come in this week, we'd hate to put our number that we've already vaccinated on top of that if they all came in on Monday and Tuesday because nobody, nobody would have had a chance to yet deploy those doses. So we're clearly over 50% of the doses that uh, have arrived prior to this week. We have an updated number? We'll get one. We're working on the number. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I have the number if you want it. Great. Go ahead, Secretary Smith. Yes, the, the vaccine shipped, and that's the, that's the number that you want to use because vaccine allocated means could be the second dose, could mean um, vaccines that haven't even been shipped. What Dr. Levine was talking about is vaccines shipped. Uh, vaccines shipped are 33.9 thousand, but as Dr. Levine said, we're just getting uh, 3,900 of those vaccines uh, this week. So you can't, um, you can't, you know, you can't practically use those. So the number is. 30,000 versus 17,653. So 30,000 in the state, 17,000 in the arms of Vermonters. Yes, 17,653. Yes, Governor. Okay. Steve? Uh, actually, this is probably for Dr. Levine, but uh, given the uh, news yesterday about the uh, Syracuse breakout, um, we did get a couple of uh, folks right into us and, and wondering how Vermonters are going to find out whether or not that strain either A is in, in Vermont or B, some of the details on the strain. You've given that already, really, but uh, how will Vermonters know that it's in Vermont, where it is, and what should they do to... The Saratoga, not Syracuse. Oh, I said Syracuse. Right. Well, they'll get it too at some point. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's yeah, probably yeah. true. So we do send uh, a sampling of our specimens to the CDC uh, every couple of weeks. Um, and now they believe they're doing that countrywide. So everyone's going to have their strains uh, examined in that way. So when CDC tells us, we'll obviously tell the state very immediately. I'm also aware that the UVM Medical Center has been doing some of this uh, genomic sequencing work as well. Uh, I don't have insight into anything that they found at this point in time, but obviously if they found the strain, we would have heard from them. Uh, but I want to know from them a little more about exactly how much uh, surveillance they're doing on that. So our team is, our lab team is reaching out to them to get an understanding of that as well. Very good, thank you. All set. Moving to the phones, we'll start with Tom from the Vermont Standard. 
Hi, everyone, and good morning. Um, although the data is still coming in, as has been indicated earlier, uh, there does seem to be some correlation between the significant spike in out-of-state travel during the holidays and through the opening of ski season. And I'm wondering if the state plans to uh, step up compliance checks at ski areas and other tourist attractions. And a corollary to that, is there any more that can be done to confirm out-of-state compliance with quarantine re requirements other than taking people at their word? Um, again, Tom, what we're doing is uh, using our contact tracing and using the data and science to determine what steps we need to take next. Uh, and there is nothing conclusive at this point in time that uh, is directly related to the ski areas and so forth. So while we're concerned, uh, we're monitoring the situation. Uh, very difficult in some respects uh, to step up uh, enforcement. Um, but, um, but we're, you know, we have, to, we have to acknowledge that we've asked the ski areas uh, to do this <clears throat> for us. And... Uh, so far uh, that they've done their part and there are very rigid guidelines that come along with that. Um, so again, we're monitoring the situation, but we have not determined that there's a direct correlation between the number of cases uh, in the ski areas uh, with, uh, with increased activity. All right, thank you. And then uh, second question, um, presumably for Secretary Smith, uh, will, will vaccinations at assisted living and residential care facilities uh, commence next week, as was initially planned? And uh, similar to a question I asked uh, a week or two ago, is there a list available from the Department on Disabilities and Aging as to where and when those vaccinations will take place? Yes, yeah, so we've actually already started with assisted living and res care, and I will... Uh, Tom, I thought we got you a list, but I will double check and make sure that you get that list. Yeah, the, the list I got was for the uh, long-term care skilled nursing facility, um, yes. but it did, it did include residential care and assisted living. Yeah, let me let me see if I, I can get a list for you. But the, uh, assisted uh, assisted living and residential care has already started. Oh, excellent! Thank you, thank you very much. That's it for me. Thank you. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Um, I suspect this question is for Secretary Smith. Um, at the last briefing, and that was last year, so it may not apply anymore, um, you were concerned that um, there was a no predictability about the supply of vaccines coming into the state. Has there been some resolution to this problem? Do you now have some confidence that the amount delivered will be what is either promised or at least what you're expecting? Um, predictability is in the eyes of the beholder, I, I, I think. And that's, the, that's what we're having a problem with here. We've been given some numbers. Uh, we'll see if those numbers hold true. They're not what we still expected. They're about a thousand short a week from what we had expected. They're more than what we got this week, which was 3,900 uh, uh, for Pfizer, which goes directly, it's skimmed off the top and goes directly to the pharmacy program for long-term care, but 3,900 in Moderna as well. Um, we have been told we're going to get 4,800 or so for next week, but we haven't confirmed that yet. And uh, I think we'll just have to see. I, I'm sorry to be so vague, but this is, this is how it is. Um, no, I was asking, so if it's vague, that, that's what I wanted to know. Um, I know with the Pfizer, there was some um, additional vaccine in vials which helped make up for some shortfall. Is that the case with the Moderna as well? I'll, I'll leave that to Dr. Levine in terms of uh, what we're finding. We are finding in the Pfizer there are some uh, vials that have some extra doses, but um, I don't know how prevalent that is. Uh, but Dr. Levine? Yeah, I'm not aware of the same situation occurring for the Moderna, only for the Pfizer. Okay, 
Thank you very much. Joe, I'll, if I could add in terms of the confidence, uh, confidence will come in time with follow through. Um, so if we're promised something and they follow through and they consistently do this over time, uh, then we'll have more confidence. But at this point in time, uh, we're just going week to week. Do you anticipate um, some kind of um, uh, interruption um, as the administrations change? I, I personally don't believe there'll be an interruption. I, I believe that we have uh, people within uh, the communities, the the businesses, the uh, the entities that are distributing uh, the vaccines, uh, as well as in the CDC and the FDA, that are doing their job. Their career uh, bureaucrats that are there and uh, and doing their their job just as they would uh, this week, as they would next week and the following week. So I don't expect any interruption. to Greg at the County Courier. Good morning, Governor. Uh, I think this might be for Dr. Levine. I'm, I'm wondering how many tests or what percentage of tests are being sent to the CDC for analysis. It seems like uh, you alluded that there may not be all that many that, that are actually sent uh, to try to identify a secondary strain. Yeah, it's in the range of about 20 tests every couple of weeks. So, and we're talking maybe one percent. Yeah, it's a small it's a small percent, but that's what we've been directed to uh, submit. So, I believe they probably have limitations getting tests from every state. And I would assume that's only the positive tests that you're. Oh yeah, sending. definitely. Um, I think this is for the governor. Uh, governor, it, it sounds like this new strain, it's only a matter of time before it makes its way to Vermont. Are you expecting that, uh, given that it seems to spread a lot easier through youthful people than the, uh, than the original strain, that it would change your decision to have in-person schools and, and uh, to begin winter sports in earnest later this month? We'll, uh, we'll make that determination uh, along the way. Uh, we are watching other states and uh, seeing uh, what, uh, how prevalent that is and, and what uh, this new strain actually does produce uh, and uh, the effects of it. Uh, and then we'll make a determination at that point. But we have not reached any conclusion at this point. Okay, thank you. Uh, I might have one third question, but I'll hold off till the end. Thank you. Stuart, NBC5. Stuart? All right. Good morning. You can hear me okay? We can. Uh, the numbers that you just gave about vaccines received and injected, my math indicates you have about 58% have been administered. Is that... Good enough? Is, are you satisfied with that number? It's, it's never good enough. Uh, we hope to get better as time goes on, and, uh, and we'll, uh, we will, I believe. Um, we'll, we'll get as many out as possible, but we're, we're doing better than most states at this point. But, uh, but again, um, as our challenge, uh, our opportunity, is always to do something better and faster. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get better. I'm confident of that. Would you support making criminal the diversion of vaccine to people who are not, you know, yet eligible, as Governor Cuomo suggested yesterday, so, you know, as, as, as like cutting the line, so to speak? Yeah, we haven't we haven't talked about that at all at this point. OK, uh, just one other thing. There, there's a kind of a somewhat alarming story in The Times Argus this morning about um, uh, a Vermont Vermonter uh, arrested by ATF. Uh, and uh, you know, accused of plotting uh, a real conspiracy theorist uh, who felt that vaccinations by the government were sort of a plot to control people. Um, did you hear about the case? Does that alarm you at all? Um, I have not heard of the case. Are you talking about locally or some uh, nationally? Yeah. Yes. 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 Lo locally. 
Uh, I have not. Yeah, a guy named Aaron Lukes. Yeah, have not heard about the case, but uh, obviously that is concerning. Okay, thanks. Wilson, DAP. Uh, hi, good morning, everybody. Um, Stuart stole my thunder on the question I was going to ask, so I will um, ask a variant of it. Nationally, there's been some criticism I've seen that the vaccination programs aren't rolling out as fast as possible. And I just did the quick math on my calculator here. You know, with 625,000 people in Vermont, to do them in six months uh, would be about 3,500 vaccinations a day. Uh, and I know we're not going to vaccinate everybody. And how quickly we can end this is a bit of a moving target. But what do you expect? Or first, are you, do you buy that this isn't moving, uh, this isn't getting going fast enough? And um, once it gets going, how big or how many cases or uh, doses a day do you think can be administered? And what's your target on the, the percent of the population to be vaccinated? Yeah, again, I'll, I'll uh, let Dr. Levine answer some of that or most of that. Uh, but from my perspective, first of all, let's, uh, let's put this in perspective. Uh, we're a lot further ahead today than we were a month ago. Uh, and we are, you know, at the mercy in some respects of the supply coming in. It's, uh, we can only distribute what we have. So when we receive more, um, we will ramp up our efforts and make sure that we get the shots into the arms of Vermonters uh, who want them uh, as well. Um, we said all along, this is going to take a little bit of time. That's why everyone has to be patient. And as Dr. Levine had said in his opening remarks, um, it's not instantaneous. You know, it's going to take um, six to 10 weeks, or six to eight weeks, I believe you said, um, to, uh, for it to be truly effective. Um, so we're c we have to con continue to be vigilant uh, along the way and make sure we're taking all the precautions we've taken over the last nine to 10 months. We can't let our guard down at this point just because we're starting to roll out the vaccinations. So um, we also hope um, and we're seeing uh, um, AstraZeneca uh, is, uh, do has been approved in, in the UK. Uh, Johnson & Johnson believes by the end of January that they may uh, be uh, be approved in some some way as more and more of these uh, entities uh, the more supply we have of safe vac vaccines uh, the more we'll be able to distribute so uh, it's hard to come up with a timeline at this point uh, but but from our standpoint we will ramp up our efforts uh, to distribute the, the vaccines as quick as we receive them uh, and uh, and it would be helpful if we knew what that supply chain looked like and how much we were going to get each work week on a consistent basis uh, so that we could ramp up our efforts and can continue to consistently uh, give the vaccinations. Dr. Levine. Yeah, thank you, Governor. The, um, you know, the national rate right now is probably 20 to 25 percent of the vaccine getting into people. So we've definitely more than doubled that. Um, a lot of criticism has been leveraged nationally at the fact that the strategy for the first phase relied on the healthcare system completely. And the healthcare system, as we know, not so much in Vermont, but elsewhere, is really stressed right now. Uh, they're stressed in terms of uh, capacity issues, they're stressed in terms of workforce issues. Um, not to give excuses, but that is uh, the, the criticism that's being uh, directed nationally. I think here in Vermont, you know, we, we have a uh, longstanding uh, vaccination uh, immunization program uh, that has been very successful in immunization efforts in the past and has worked well with healthcare partners in the past to make uh, them as well prepared as possible when vaccine comes into the state. We have um, already in the healthcare workforce made good inroads, I think, on vaccinating that, that aspect of priority group 1A. And uh, we're successful at actually hastening that process early on when the vaccine first arrived. And then a little bit out of our control, we thought, is the federal pharmacy partnership 
with the long-term care facility vaccine effort. Uh, but even there, um, we've been able to be very aggressive as a state and set expectations that were higher than those that were contracted for in that federal pharmacy partnership. And as you heard from Secretary Smith, we're actually starting assisted livings already this week, which was not on any timeline when this all began. So uh, it is possible to uh, rev the system up, if you will. Uh, as you've heard from uh, myself and Secretary Smith before, part of the future as we get out of phase 1A and into more general groups certainly uh, includes the healthcare system as an important partner, includes the pharmacies as important partners, but then begins to really build on our success in the testing enterprise and in the sites we've set up around the state to be able to have larger numbers of people and larger amounts of throughput uh, to meet those populations who will be much more, if I could use the word, simply defined, whether it be by age or another criteria, so that uh, it won't be as complex an undertaking as going into long-term care facilities or finding all the healthcare workers who satisfy certain criteria uh, as it is in this first phase. So I think you'll see things really um, increasing in a, in a throughput level, if you will, at that point in time. I don't know if Secretary Smith has anything he'd like to add to that. No, um, uh, Commissioner, I think, Dr. Levine, I think um, you said it all. I mean, we're close to 60 percent, as you said, we're one of the top in the nation in terms of making sure that we get vaccine into the arms of people. But with the uncertainty of the supply line, it is, um, it's uncertainty all the way. So far, I'm pretty proud of uh, what the state has been able to do given um, the supply line, and we will continue to do that. And you're absolutely right. As soon as we get out of phase 1A and into the community vaccination program uh, that we all plan for, that uh, age band, I think you'll see the pace pick up a lot quicker as well. well okay, great. Thank you. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thanks, Rebecca. Good morning. <clears throat> uh, maybe for Commissioner Sherling and uh, following up on the news story that Stuart mentioned from last night about the arrest on the Chittenden County in Chittenden County made by ATF on the guy who apparently obtained firearms from two gun dealers and made threats to interfere with vaccine distribution. What? What does your police intelligence or just police reports show about how many other threats there have been made about distribution of the vaccine? Uh, is this a, a one only or have there been other threats out there too that you're aware of? Uh, good morning, at least for two more minutes. Uh, Thanks for the question, Mike. Um, we are uh, up to speed on the ATF arrest, and uh, we're tracking uh, information inbound on that suspect for uh, several days prior to uh, the federal government's intervention. Um, relative to other threats, we don't generally discuss uh, threat posture and uh, inbound intelligence, but uh, I can say with uh, sort of broad, uh, a broad descriptor that um, this is not a widespread um, repetitive type of thing that we're seeing happen. Okay, good. Uh, my second question, uh, I'm not sure who this goes to, but uh, since last week, I've been flooded with follow-up emails, calls, and texts from the general public, shocked at the state's response to boot state police and local police and firefighters out of the receiving line for COVID vaccines. And this comes from all over the state. At least seven counties said that police are police and firefighters are on the front lines of emergency calls, including motor vehicle crashes, heart attacks, suicide attempts, other emergencies. One of them mentioned how the police now have to go to these hotels that the state has set up as temporary homes for the homeless. And a lot of these are not wearing masks. Police are often the first ones to arrive with defibrillators. Now I'm told that ski patrols, 
and at least two ski resorts have already received their vaccine shots. And I actually received a photo of one ski patrol getting their shots at the Rutland Medical Center. And somebody asked, will swimming lifeguards be put ahead of police and firefighters? And another asked, seemed to hit it on the head by asking, is there any hope that these public employees, that Vermont taxpayers have invested large sums of money to properly train to make sure they don't get infected or infect their families and coworkers? I know the governor said they were going to reexamine it. Is there any update? on where police and fire stand. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if we're, we're ready to answer that at this point, but uh, Secretary Smith or S Commissioner Shirley. Let me take a stab at it. Um, Mike, we are examining it right now. I think there'll be, we're looking at sort of the, the, the issue of first responders, um, including those issues that you just mentioned in terms of coming to uh, medical events. So I would, I would think within the next um, seven days, we should have a resolution on what that definition looks like and, uh, and moving forward on vaccination w with the population that's within that definition of first responders. The, the, the one thing that you had mentioned with the ski patrol troubles me and we'll look into that. Okay. It's, there's a couple of different places that they've gotten up. And I do realize that they are out on the mountain and they do offer some first aid, but not as probably as much as state troopers uh, on the road. Yeah, and some of those might fall under EMS as well, Mike. Um, they may be dual purpose and, and if they're under the, or the EMTs or EMS, uh, they would be vaccinated under 1A. Commissioner Sherling, I thought he started to say something too. Uh, I didn't, but uh, I, I would just observe the, the same thing the governor did. Uh, some of the uh, ski patrol services may have uh, or be affiliated with EMS licenses, which is uh, why uh, they may be um, in the line at this point. And as Secretary Smith indicated, it's something we are taking a, a hard look at. And I think we uh, we will have a, a resolution in the not too distant future. We are fully aware for those first responders uh, listening that it is an integrated model in Vermont that uh, all the responders are handling medical calls, uh, assisting with trauma, assisting with transport. So um, we, we're well aware of that. Apparently there was a meeting that was called last week for fire chiefs and police chiefs, but they all got approximately, uh, I think an hour and a half notice of a conference call to discuss this thing. Uh, is that really realistic when a lot of the volunteer fire chiefs have full-time jobs to expect them to jump on a call with about 90 minutes notice? No, it's, uh, it's not a good observation, Mike. We also followed up uh, actually prior to that uh, meeting that popped up on a rather quick timeline, as you indicated. Um, we followed up with a, an email to all the agency heads of first responder uh, organizations statewide. So they all should be in the loop either uh, via teleconference or uh, via email. All right, we got to move Thank you to very much, all of you. Peter Hirschfeld, VPR. Uh, Governor, another vaccine prioritization question for you. you you've said in the past that Vermonters of color will be prioritized. Um, it's been unclear exactly how uh, in the statements to date about age banding and chronic conditions haven't made any mention of people of color. Um, can you talk any more precisely at this point about how the vaccine prioritization process yeah. will acknowledge the heightened concerns? We're, we're looking at that with the, advi with the advisory group and, uh, and I believe uh, Dr. Lean has more maybe to offer on that. Yeah, that, that has not uh, disappeared as a key part of the strategy and a key part of our, our priorities. Um, we're just in the midst of working out exactly how that will look uh, in our scheme that we've plotted out. Um, again, much of the work that needs to be done in this area is education, communication, appropriate messaging, 
appropriate inter interpretation uh, service availability because um, related to the issues that uh, make the BIPOC population a priority group and relate to some of the historic injustices that have occurred, uh, those considerations are first and foremost and really important to deal with. Um, we are also recognizing that sometimes use of the word prioritization is actually not going to have the desired effect uh, because, uh, again, due to historical issues involving specifically black populations uh, with our healthcare system, uh, prioritization may be looked at uh, in a negative light. So obviously that isn't the goal of a vaccination program that you want to get to those at highest risk. So it's really important for us to get these other considerations with communication, interpretation, messaging, education, uh, taken care of appropriately. And we'll be working with the advisory group. We'll be working with our health equity team as part of the health department. We'll be working with um, the governor's appointee to racial justice equity, uh, Susanna Davis, and others uh, uh, who are most directly impacted by this to make sure that we get it right. Um, so more to come on that. We have, I, I don't want to use the word luxury of time because we're talking in a more time pressured way about vaccination, but the reality is we won't be getting to these other phases uh, till certainly late this month at the earliest. Uh, and again, depending on federal allocations. So can I take that to mean commissioner that, that it may not be the case that people of color would have an opportunity to get the vaccine more quickly than uh, similarly situated non-person of color in the state? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that message away at all. Um, I, I would take the message that there probably won't be um, the next priority group would be only people of color um, as, as, the, as the way that we navigate these waters that I've just talked about. Uh, but that does not mean that they would not be uh, a high priority within groups by any means. Is that clear? Thank you. It is. Thank you. Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Thank you. As I understood what Secretary Smith and Dr. Levine said, Vermont is getting vaccines regularly and has been able to get those into the arms of people who are eligible. Is there any disconnect between what's been delivered and administered and 100% distribution? Given what Dr. Levine just pointed out about the national medical system being overstressed right now, would the state consider using Vermont National Guard medics to get more vaccines into people's arms if necessary? Yeah. Lisa, we'll be using a number of different platforms and a number of different strategies as we move forward. Um, so we are considering all of that um, in every way we possibly can to make sure we do this in an expeditious way uh, to get shots in the arms of Vermonters and get the vaccine distributed as best we can. But we need some consistency. We need to have some faith uh, in the supply chain before we set up uh, any of these uh, new strategies. But we are, we are going to be utilizing all different types of platforms uh, in, the, uh, in the coming months. Great, and thank you, by the way, for our local emergency management folks getting vaccinated in the last two weeks. It made us all feel a lot better. Oh, great. Um, my next question is for Dr. Er for Commissioner Pichak. Commissioner, the town-by-town -town COVID map, the actual map, that shows the cases per in the last two weeks versus the list of towns which shows cumulative cases. That map in both instances shows no cases for some towns, notably those without, that are without a post office. We know that there are cases in those towns like Duxbury and Faston, but then we see that there are towns like Middlesex also without a post office that shows up as having a specific number of cases, both cumulatively and in the past two weeks. Our readers would like to know if there's a way to know actual and current case counts in towns without post offices. Well, uh, you know, thank you for the question. We'll look into that data. I think 
it is maintained by the uh, Vermont Department of, of Health, and it all depends on what address is put down when someone seeks a test. And if they're getting the test by mail, then they're probably putting a post office box, but maybe there's other data available that can put uh, where that individual resides. Just um, a point, though, I mean, when we're looking at our cases and our trends and our forecasting, you know, the county level is about as specific as we go, because even if you're in one town, you know, and there's no cases and the next town has a lot of cases, there's a lot of travel back and forth between those towns anywhere in Vermont. So I think we worry about a false impression that there's safety when cases are low or there's no cases listed in a town, because as we've been saying for nine or 10 months, the virus is really everywhere. Thank you. Yeah, that's what our readers are also concerned about. They would like to know why does it look like Basin is a safe haven when Basin is bordered by Moortown, Warren, and Wakefield. Lisa, are you all set, or was that a question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks. Kat, WCAS? Hi. So I kind of feel like this question has been asked a lot, but not fully answered at this press briefing. I would expect that if it was a federal supply problem, as you've been saying, that we would then see a higher percentage of our vaccines already distributed and for us to say to the feds, hey, look, you know, we ran through those and we're really ready for more. So can you explain to the public exactly why we have 30,000 doses and only 17,000 have been administered? Well, there's a bit of a lag uh, in terms of when we receive them. So when we report uh, on one day, we might have received, uh, let's say, 8,000 of, uh, of these vaccines in a day or two before. Um, certainly not enough time to to get the vaccinations out to uh, to people in need. So there's a natural kind of lag time and and a built up reserve in some respects uh, as we move forward. So uh, again, hard to um, hard to contemplate that, um, but uh, but as long as we uh, continue to, to not lose ground and uh, continue to increase the, the percentage as we move forward, uh, we'll be moving in the, in the right direction. I think you can use, utilize that for almost anything uh, we do in terms of production. Uh, you never get to uh, complete 100% unless you're out, and we don't want to run out. So then what are we doing to speed up the lag time, as you mentioned there, between getting the shots in and getting them out to the healthcare workers who need them? Well, I think, I think it's been described. I mean, when we go to a different system that's under more of our control, uh, I think you'll see a natural progression, and you'll see an increase uh, in the uh, in the rate of uh, vaccinations given. Uh, but at this point in time, just getting started again. I mean, this is new uh, in terms of a, a mass uh, uh, vaccination process, and, and not knowing how much we're getting in. So uh, we're only what uh, five weeks into this, uh, maybe. You know, so I think we're doing, as was said, I think we're doing pretty well. Um, but we can do better, and we're going to do better. We just need to make sure that we have a consistent supply and that we can count on, and then we'll be able to set, set up uh, the the platforms and the strategies uh, to distribute the, the vaccinations. But until we have that consistency, it's a little difficult to do, and having it all under our control, which it is not at this point in time because of the contract that the federal government had with some of the pharmacies. And they and they're reporting. I kept keep coming back to. And they're reporting as well as there's a three day lag in the reporting of the of the pharmacies uh, back to the federal government. So we don't have up to date da data from them either. So again, once we move forward, uh, we'll have more up to date uh, data and we'll be able to uh, distribute. I think further. I was coming back to a quote that I heard several of you say during the fall, which was that Vermont would be ready for the vaccine before the vaccine was ready for us. And I kind of have to question whether we're as ready as we could have been if we have this lag time and if we didn't foresee some of these issues with the federal government distribution system. I mean, there were months ahead of this. Oh, again, Governor, can I? Yeah. I, well, again, I would, I would argue, Kat, we're doing, uh, we're one of the best in the nation, so we must be doing something right. Um, so I, I, I'm failing to see, uh, I guess your logic in this, um, but, uh, we can, we can debate this, uh, in the future, but we're, we're going to get better, but I, I doubt we'll get to a hundred percent 
uh, which is what you're advocating for, without running out. And that's not something we want to do. So there's a natural lag time in every production cycle. Uh, Secretary Smith. Yeah, I, Governor, you hit it on, on the head here. I, I, I mean, let's put this in context. We're, we're one of the leaders in the nation in terms of what we're doing and how we're doing it. No one could have predicted. We were promised a lot of things at the federal government, and no one could have predicted how this would have rolled out from the federal government to sort of say, can you predict from the federal government what you were promised and what you actually got, I, I think is a little disingenuous. So the, the, the aspect here is the fact is we are one of the best in the nation in ro rolling this out. There is some lag time in the reporting aspect of it. We probably are higher than 17,000, uh, but there is lag time in the, in the reporting. And the way that the, dis the distribution happens uh, from the federal government is getting it out once we receive it, that there is a lag as well. So, you know, the, 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 I, I, you know, I go back to look what we're doing in comparison to everybody else in the nation, and, and uh, Vermont is certainly at, at the top of the heap here. And Kat, uh, Dr. Levine here, I just want to give two simple examples to illustrate what we're talking about. Let's say today, Tuesday, 1,500 doses are provided to one of the three pharmacies who are doing long-term care facilities. They already have Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday schedules in all the long-term care facilities that will exhaust that 1,500 doses. However, none of them have been given out as of today, and if you ask tomorrow, it still won't be a majority of the 1,500, but by the end of the week, all 1,500 will have been given out. Same thing with the hospital. If we send the UVM Medical Center 1,500 doses, which will actually go directly to them um, from the federal government if we design it that way, they have clinics scheduled today, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, for portions of their healthcare workforce who are already pre-scheduled uh, and portions of the workforce outside of their employment who are already scheduled, uh, who will utilize all of those doses over the next four days. But if you look at a statistic right now, it'll look like none of those doses have been used, and as each day goes by, only a quarter of them will have been used. So it may look like we're behind, but this is the reality of how you schedule administration of a treatment like this uh, in, in real time. And then as the, uh, Secretary Smith pointed out, especially with the long-term care facilities, by virtue of the contract they're under with CDC, uh, there is a natural lag time in their reporting that can go as long as 72 hours, although we've really worked with them to compress that as much as possible so it gets closer to the 24-hour reporting time uh, so that they may have actually delivered doses and we just don't have them in our immunization registry yet because they haven't reported them through that. A long-winded answer, but uh, I think it's important for everyone to understand the process that this goes through. It is, and actually that was very helpful, Dr. Levine, because that gives us a sense of, okay, well, there are the clinics scheduled on those days, so those vaccines are slated to go out on those days, and that's why you have to schedule three or four days out. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Aaron, VT Digger. When it comes to ski resort cases, could you explain how the state performs contact tracing in instances where maybe a visitor uh, comes from out of state, um, infects a, a, you know, another person in Vermont and then leaves town? Um, is, is the health department able to follow up with those out of staters and find out maybe who else they've exposed or uh, how, does, how does that work? I, again, I'll let Dr. Levine uh, speak to uh, the contact tracing uh, procedure, but but they do uh, contact people out of state and uh, tr trace those uh, those cases as far as they can. Dr. Levine. Yeah. So, uh, as the governor said, we do talk to people who are out of state. We also automatically, if we have a result on a Massachusetts resident who uh, tests positive in Vermont, 
The Massachusetts Department of Health is aware of that positive test, and we've uh, allowed them to then get involved with the contact tracing as well. Uh, I think your question's alluding to the fact that um, there may be people visiting ski resorts who uh, will at, at some point test positive. So we are aware of them. Uh, it does not mean though, and I wanna say this specifically, that at this point in time that we've detected transmission occurring uh, within those sites, okay? It can be someone who arrived here from another state, tested positive because they developed symptoms and wanted to seek care, uh, and then went back home, it doesn't necessarily mean that they um, were a transmission mechanism to infect uh, a whole bunch of people at the sites. And especially because the sites are all using very good protocols to make sure that uh, all the distancing and masking, et cetera, requirements are adhered to. Okay, well then, do you have any particular explanation as to how Killington, Dover, and Burke all saw increases in their COVID cases over the past couple of weeks as the ski season started? Yeah, no, I saw your, uh, your article about that, and our, our, our EPI team is looking into that further, but prior to this, we have not actually noted that um, there were transmissions occurring within those areas. So... Again, you know, we do have areas of the state that become hot at one point and not another, and other states that cool off, other parts of the state that cool off, just like we're seeing more cases in some of our southern counties right now uh, than we were previously, and we're seeing less cases in Washington and Orange County uh, than we had previously. So there is some element of uh, peaks and troughs uh, within individual areas as well. Okay. Um, I also have a question. Um, Ohio and, and a number of other states have noticed a uh, high percentage of long-term care staff refusing to get the COVID vaccine. Do you have the number of uh, long-term care staff that have consented to receive the vaccine so far, or alternatively, how many have refused or turned down the vaccine so far? Yeah, that is something I really want to know, and I don't have that number yet. I think it's early in the game yet um, to know if somebody's a true person who says no or a person who they just haven't been there at the right time with regards to shifts or what have you. So we are interested in that information as well. I hope that Ohio's data isn't uh, generalizable to other states. Um, I certainly believe based on our, our informal surveys of healthcare workers in Vermont uh, that 70 to 80 percent uh, uptake of the vaccine should be expected. Uh, but we'll, we'll get you information like that when we, when we actually have it at, at the right point in time. I think it's still a little early yet after only a few weeks to, to know for sure who has absolutely said they don't want it versus uh, just hasn't gotten it yet. If you come back and you realize that, you know, only 40% of, of long-term care staff have been vaccinated. Are there any, like, thoughts about planning some sort of way to come back at them or, or a way to try to change people's minds about getting the vaccine? Yeah, I, I, would, I would be shocked if it was, it was very low, um, you know, in terms of people taking the vaccine. But obviously, uh, education would be important. Uh, we could not mandate the vaccine, as I've said before, because it's uh, under an emergency use authorization. It's not an FDA-approved uh, treatment. It's uh, only got the EUA, so uh, states can't actually uh, mandate the use of it. But at the same time, uh, I'm sure there are other avenues we could go down that are far less coercive and far more educational for those employees. You know, by and large, people who work in long-term care facilities are very dedicated to the population they serve. We all know they don't get paid extraordinary salaries, and they stay there and do a lot of hard work. Uh, and then when there's an outbreak, they actually work even longer and harder. So I would find it hard to believe they wouldn't want to protect both themselves and those they care for. 
at a higher rate than 40 or 50 percent for sure. Uh, but we'll, we'll let you know as we find out more. Okay, thank you very much. Kim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. Uh, as you know, the, the federal direct payments uh, have come in to a lot of people, especially direct uh, deposit. And I, the number I think we were talking about is uh, Vermont would get about $350 million total. Does that sound um, a, a reasonable estimate? I, I, that does sound right, as I recall. You know, it's going to be a ballpark anyway. And I'm wondering what, you're, what you hope Vermonters will do with that money. Yeah, well, I think they have to determine that on their own. Uh, obviously, we all have to prioritize and what comes first, uh, taking care of their families, um, making sure that they, you know, put, uh, uh, put food on the table and have a roof over their heads and so forth and so on, uh, and then go from there. Uh, I know that many uh, will turn around and spend it, uh, actually, uh, on, on things that they either need or want. And uh, that's totally up to them. It's their money uh, to dis to uh, to spend as they see fit. Is, is there any idea, of, you know, that they're going to restart or have restarted the PUA and the and the regular UI extra payments? Is it any any idea of how much money that will bring into the state, or is that is that too uh, amorphous? I think it's about three hundred dollars a person. And, and how many, how many, it's like 18,000 people. I don't know. I was, <laughs> yeah, you, I, I'm yeah. not, yeah, I, I'm not <laughs> sure <laughs> the exact, the exact number, but I think it is probably um, 10 to 20,000 people is what I'm guessing. Uh, maybe uh, Commissioner Harrington would have uh, a better range than that. Thank you, Governor. Um, I'd have to pull up the most recent uh, data for people filing uh, to know that. So I'm happy to do that and, and follow up. Okay, you can you can throw that over. And also, there there was a question of whether the new guidelines would allow you to use the the trust fund uh, in more discretionary way. Is that is that part of the new plan or no? I'm I'm not aware um, of flexibility within the trust fund. Yeah, I didn't, uh, I didn't and, hear anything about that. And either. Governor, I would I would agree with that. Um, to my knowledge, there is no flexibility uh, in the bill that allows Vermont to use its trust fund dollars in in a different way. Um, and I did look was just looking at the the total number of individuals that receive benefits uh as of december 12th if that number were to stay the same it's about uh 31,000 if you combine all the programs together um so there was as of that week roughly 8,600 people in pua um it was the last uh, one of the last groups um receiving extended benefits uh there was about 9,800 people in peuc and uh, about 11,900. I do believe we've got some some additional numbers as well um, that I can pull. But that, you know, anybody who files for benefits in any of those programs um, would be eligible uh, to receive the, the $300 if they are eligible to receive the underlying benefit. All right. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. Andrea, seven days. Hi there. Um, I wanted to follow up on the vaccinations in um, assisted living and residential care facilities. Um, do those vaccinations fall under the pharmacy program, or are those uh, are those uh, things that the state is running? Yeah, I believe it's under the pharmacies, but uh, Secretary Smith. Yeah, that's correct, Governor. They're under the federal pharmacy program. Okay. Um, and as far as how how the um, vaccinations in the state so far have um, broken down, I know the sort of ballpark goal was um, kind of half to kind of split the vaccinations 50-50 um, as, as we're kind of rolling them out between healthcare workers and, um, and the long-term care facilities. Um, how, how is that kind of playing out 
um, and and uh, are are we sort of at at the goals for um, for kind of getting those two groups vaccinated at the same time? Secretary Smith, maybe you can work backwards and and uh, give a date. I mean, we're hopeful that uh, by mid January we'll have all the long term care facilities done. And uh, maybe I think to be by the end of January, maybe all the uh, assisted living. Is that correct? First dose. That's correct, Governor. Uh, the we're hoping and we're working with the pharmacies right now to try to speed up the schedule to have the long term care facilities that includes assisted living, the skill assisted living and residential care. We have we anticipate the skilled nursing facilities will be done this week, actually. Um, uh, 30 to 31 are already done. We have 37 in the state. We anticipate to have those finished this week, and we hope to have the residential uh, care and the assisted living facilities done by mid, uh, mid-January. We anticipate that the rest of the vaccination program uh, will conclude at the end of uh, January. That includes all health care workers, all EMS. We've done a third, um, closing in on 40% of uh, EMS so far. So we are well along um, in terms of where we are with uh, uh, into this program. I think we're about, um, Governor, if I could just take a moment. I We are uh, uh, within uh, about a quarter of the way through 1A in total. And I, if I remember correctly, I, I think uh, Walgreens and Kinney's have been particularly receptive uh, to uh, increasing the rate in vaccinations. Is that right? They've been extremely helpful. Walgreens and Kinney's have been extremely helpful in accelerating the time schedule. And has has there been any kind of additional need to transfer um, transfer shipments that the state is getting over into that pharmacy program? I know there were some kind of there was some shuffling early on. Yeah, if it goes below thirty nine hundred on our annual um, uh, in our weekly allocation, we're going to have to shuffle. We're going to have to bring uh, more over to the um, long term care program, but. Right now, we're we're able to hold our own. Okay. Um, thank you, Joe Lee, local twenty-two. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, we can. Great. Um, I wanted to know. I know it was mentioned after phase one A, um, the state will move to the age band. Uh, program, but could you clarify where Group 1B fits in? I know vaccines, uh, it was mentioned last week, um, vaccines were going to need to go over those in Group 1B. Yeah, we're, um, we're, not, use, yeah, we're not using the 1B. Uh, we're, we're just using 1A, and then we're going to the age banding. So, oh, I see. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. No, just just totally uh, disregard one B. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Ed, Newport Daily Express. Yeah, my my uh, question actually uh, just uh, backing up to it, it was Mike Donahue uh, talking about law enforcement. Uh, Governor, on uh, the ninth of this month is the National Law Enforcement Appreciation Day, and um, they have been kind of the um, hidden frontliners out there uh, who have to respond to all kinds of uh, uh, scenes and parts of people who don't wear face masks. Is there something you'd uh, like to say? Um, yeah, out of respect to uh, our law enforcement and the appreciation day. Yeah, and we'll obviously be putting something out on social media in that regard. Um, I have a great deal of respect for anyone uh, on the front lines and responds to emergencies and running towards danger instead of away. So 
uh, we have a lot to be grateful for, for that community in particular. So uh, we, um, we work, uh, we have a lot of work to do uh, in that area, uh, but uh, under the leadership of Commissioner Sherling, uh, we look forward uh, to providing uh, for them and, uh, and providing Vermonters uh, the protection they deserve. Um, and public safety is, is one of our number, uh, our highest priority. Uh, in this, uh, and, and we rely on them and others uh, to provide during this pandemic uh, the, the the basic needs of uh, of public health and uh, um, public safety. Uh, would uh, Mr. Sherling like to respond as well? I think the governor uh, encapsulated most of it. Um, there are uh, there's first responders all over. Uh, Vermont and law enforcement and elsewhere um, who have done uh, yeoman's work over the last 10 months, uh, much of it uh, in the background as it usually is. And, uh, you know, as you observed, uh, in just a few days we'll have an opportunity uh, to recognize that publicly. Um, but they should know uh, on a day-to-day -day basis that uh, whether it's within public safety or the administration or Vermonters by and large, um, really appreciate uh, what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, both during the pandemic and beyond. Great. Thank you very much. Austin, Burlington Free Press. Hi. Uh, I believe my questions are best directed for the governor and or uh, Secretary Moore. And my first question actually has to do with the uh, status of wrestling. I've, I've heard in the past couple of weeks, uh, multiple coaches have reached out and they're concerned that their sport's been dismissed out of hand and that their uh, proposed compromises or tweaks to decrease the risks associated with their sport have been hand-waved hand -waved as well. Uh, they note that while their competition is high contact, it's also short duration. Most matches last less than three minutes and you know masking is easily achievable. Is there any possibility to revisit the current ban on wrestling or and, and to allow it to you know go forth in some form this winter um i don't know if secretary moore is on today i am governor okay is that something you can answer i sure i'm i'm happy to speak to that um one of one of the challenges is obviously the the level of risk um posed by the the very close contact that wrestlers find themselves in um, currently, our athletic um, youth and or school-based and recreational are limited to no contact practice sessions. Um, and in corresponding with, with many of the, um, the members of the Vermont community that are in, involved in wrestling have encouraged them not to see uh, the directive as an all-or-nothing proposition, but rather to look for opportunities for wrestlers to pursue coach-led practice sessions that can be focused on individual skills building, strength and conditioning, et cetera. Um, we understand that, that there, everyone is anticipating that we may ultimately be able to move to, to more traditional expanded practices for many sports, as well as ultimately resume um, interscholastic and intra-squad competitions. And we are continuing to look at different options that may allow wrestling to proceed, um, but it is really a, a challenging set of circumstances giving, given the extreme close proximity um, that wrestlers find themselves in and engaging in a match. Thank you. And my second question has to do with basketball, where I've also heard from coaches recently uh, concerned about the way the guidelines are structured for what they can do. Uh, with hours limited now after school, they fear there isn't enough time and space to allow everyone to practice, and they're concerned that these limitations on participants uh, could end up negating the intended boost to students' mental health, uh, particularly, you know, if in a few weeks, if, you know, they're able to compete and cuts have to be made and they're premature in any way to, to accommodate everyone. Uh, and, and they just want to know what could be done to address this if there could be some easing of restrictions to allow everybody, you know, the, the same chance to uh, practice. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to speak to that as well. Uh, this, this is a, a slow restart um, after mm -hmm. what was a, about a six-week pause in athletics, and I, I think it's important to view it in that context. 
Um, we're looking to make sure that we can, can resume athletic activities in a way that, that doesn't increase the transmission of the COVID virus. Um, and so felt very strongly that early on it was important to have a, a no contact approach that includes limits on the number of people um, in a particular venue or facility at, at, at one time, currently limited to, to 25. Uh, our hope is that, that uh, as we've seen so far, there haven't been cases attributed to this resumption of athletic activities. Uh, we look at that data very carefully and uh, look forward to being able to, to resume those expanded or more traditional practices. And there will be another um, bit of time that, that will need to pass between the, the resumption of traditional practices where athletes may be coming into contact with each other incidentally before we proceed to, to full-blown games. And so I, I think there will be time um, for, for all of those pieces to sort themselves out. Great. Thank, thank you very much. On an interesting note, um, I did observe that Vermont was one of the leaders in terms of probably the only state who required um, masks to be worn by those playing sports, youth sports and others. And uh, I saw that uh, Boston University yesterday uh, had their first game, women's uh, basketball, and uh, they required uh, masks uh, for their participants. And today is the men's game, and they're requiring masks for their participants. So. Um, I think this is going to be a part of uh, the future, at least in the short term. Uh, and, but, uh, but I'm very proud of the fact that Vermont uh, has led the way once again. Next up is Andrew, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, you've outlined concerns that you have with the vaccine supply line. Does that translate in any way to uncertainty over receiving the second doses, which people are due to start getting in the next few days? I don't believe that's in question. They were set aside in reserve, so I don't believe that there's any question that we will be getting uh, those uh, second doses. Uh, Dr. Levine, anything? That's correct. Yeah. Dr. Levine is shaking his head yes. Uh, there, there will be no disruption in the uh, second dose. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, uh, you also, uh, Governor and Dr. Levine, at the start of the conference, urged uh, people to, to get tested. I'm wondering, um, what's our current capacity for testing, and uh, how much are we actually utilizing at this point? Yeah. It, uh, it, and aside from the, uh, the disruption that Commissioner Pisiak alluded to, is there a sense that you have that asymptomatic people may be reluctant to get tested? perhaps over the disruption that that would result if they came back with a positive test. Yeah, I, I don't believe um, that um, we were increasing testing uh, for dramatically over the last uh, couple of months, and Vermonters were willing. I think it's just the, the holiday uh, week or holiday period that slowed people down from getting tested. We just wanted to remind everyone that we do have the capacity, uh, and uh, we want, uh, want people to... to get tested uh, so that if we find uh, there is uh, COVID in a community uh, that we can stop the spread uh, as fast as possible. Uh, that's part of the answer uh, until the vaccine uh, is administered. Um, maybe Secretary Smith could give us the numbers uh, in terms of what, uh, how many we can do uh, now in a week. Governor, we can uh, do quite a bit. Um, right, the last seven days we did uh, 29,000, but we've been averaging between 30 and 33,000 uh, uh, over a seven-day period uh, for quite some time, and we probably can do 38, 39,000 as we move forward. Our highest, I believe, was 40,000. That was including. Uh, college kids when they were here, but we have the capacity through um, up to 19 locations, um, many of which, as the doctor has said, 15 are open uh, considerable hours, uh, a number of days a week, uh, full time. So it, we have the capacity, if people want to get tested, we have the capacity to test. Thank you very much. Guy Page. Uh, Governor, I have a question about the uh, 
homeschooling? First of all, can you hear me well? We can. Well, thank you. Uh, I got a, a call from a, a homeschooler who said that uh, her, her child, she homeschools uh, for the first time this year, and she's counted in the ADM uh, because he was in the school year last year, at the beginning of the school year, and the state is telling schools to rely on that number for revenue. Uh, the school is receiving $18,000, even though her kid is one of, I guess, six kids in, the, in that district who don't have, uh, they also uh, don't have any access at all due to the school because of COVID. So here the school is essentially getting money for them. They don't have any access to the school. Uh, given that, should maybe the state be revisiting that whole idea of, of no, no money for homeschoolers, of, you know, providing some help for them in some way? Uh, Secretary Smith, do you want to try and answer that? Secretary French? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Secretary Governor Smith, I, I don't think I don't, I don't think we want you to answer that. No, <laughs> thank you, Governor. I was sitting here saying, well, "How am I going to answer that?" <laughs> uh, yeah, this is Secretary French. I was looking forward to Secretary French. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, happy to happen to take uh, a whack at that. A couple things, um, <clears throat> and Sir, I mean, you raised some good points. Uh, first thing is, in our, in our system, money doesn't follow the child, so. When we start talking about county students and districts receiving dollars per student, that isn't actually what happens. Um, they, they accumulate students, which then certainly impacts their tax rate, but there's no dollars uh, being generated in that regard. Um, you know, what you described uh, certainly could have happened. Uh, firstly, uh, we count students in a census period at the beginning of the school year. So um, if a student was attending school for the first 30 days, essentially, and then withdrew, uh, they would be captured in the district account in the beginning of the year. Oh, well, of course, this year, uh, something different happened in that um, the General Assembly enacted essentially a, a cap on ABM levels. So uh, the levels, of, you know, due to the uncertainties as a result of COVID uh, pandemic, um, ADM levels were frozen for districts. So a lot, a lot going on in it, but uh, the questions you've raised about the, the larger policy conversations, I guess, are, are good ones, but um, there's a lot of complexity involved in the actual calculation. Hmm. Uh, but it, it still does sort of seem like a unique situation, uh, and maybe the, there should be some reach out to the to homeschoolers, some way to, to, to help them out in this. Uh, is there any anything really the agency can do to be helping the, the homeschoolers? Yeah, we do try to act as a resource, but you know, part of I would say traditionally uh, the idea of homeschooling is that when one would independently educate students, um, we do have a, pol a long-standing policy initiative in the state that um, requires school districts to have policies around home study, which uh, requires them to describe to what extent they allow home study students to participate in school-sponsored activities. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, COVID's uh, brought a lot of new questions to the table around flexibility and enrollment. And I think um, it'll be interesting, uh, certainly pursue with the General Assembly, uh, any revisions to home study as a result of what we've learned through our COVID experience. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Avery, WCAX. My question is probably for Governor Scott or Dr. Levine. There was an op-ed in the Boston Globe a few days ago urging um, states and hospitals that were experiencing a lot of um, activity to call on retired nurses and uh, medical students to help with vaccine distribution. Is that something Vermont has discussed? Yeah, we've considered uh, a lot of different approaches, and uh, we built up a medical reserve early on. Um, so we are contemplating uh, utilizing something of that nature, but maybe Commissioner Levine can answer further. <clears throat> Even without uh, the op-ed, which I have not read, um, as the governor said, through the Medical Reserve Corps and just through brainstorming, uh, the, those issues have come up under consideration. Um, it's a fairly low-risk enterprise for the person who is administering the vaccine, um, you know, uh, somewhat akin to our testing situations, uh, where as long as everybody's abiding by the proper guidance, uh, it's a very safe enterprise. Uh, so 
it's on the drawing board. I, I wouldn't say it's uh, fully fleshed out and developed at this point in time. But you're correct, you know, as we get into okay. these larger facilities that are going to vaccinate larger numbers of people, uh, you do want to have adequate throughput. So uh, the, more, the more staff you have, the better. All right. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Uh, great, thanks. Uh, one for the governor and one for the doctor, if I may. Uh, governor, in the beginning, you'd, you'd mentioned um, you read the daily death rates and stuff. Uh, and I was wondering, um, before the pandemic, uh, if you had, you know, subscribed to a daily paper and, and like, read the obituaries in a daily paper before this all started? Um, I wouldn't say I would do that on a daily basis, but yes, I, I would say that I do look through uh, obituaries to see uh, who I might recognize and, and so forth. Uh, so the answer is yes. Well, what would the, uh, what would the COVID only uh, death rate uh percentage being between oh, six and 16 I don't know. percent all i know is steve we're and in a pandemic right now in a, a public health emergency where people are dying every day because of this virus and i want to know how many are dying and how do we prevent that from happening in the future that's my only point but but yeah no, if your point is that people that. people die every day i understand that but not from the pandemic, not from this virus. And that's what I, you know, that's what they, it gets sent to me on a daily basis and I pay attention to, but I do look at other obituaries. Yes. Well, but obviously there's a lot of comorbidities and there's like an old Ukrainian saying that, you know, if you live next to the cemetery, you can't cry for everyone. Uh, and I realize that every death is a horrible thing but the average age being what it is and, and the comorbidities being what they are, uh, it's, it's horrible, but uh, hopefully we've, we've turned the corner on this, I think. Well, in terms of the death rate, um, it continues to rise. So um, we haven't turned the corner on that yet, but we're all hopeful. Yeah, okay, great. Um, uh, one for the doctor, if I may. Um, Dr. Levine, um, earlier some, uh, someone had mentioned um, uh, the people in Ohio uh, refusing the vaccinations. And um, I had read that uh, in L.A. County, uh, L.A. County alone, 20 to 40 percent of the medical frontline workers uh, were offered the vaccine and refused it. And in some neighboring counties, uh, up to 50% uh, refusal rate. Um, uh, you know, do you have any explanation for this? Or what you think with this might be just like uh, the, the younger workers that would be refusing the uh, uh, acceptance? You know, that's a really good question. <clears throat> if we look at vax, what the term that is uh, used nowadays is vaccine hesitancy. And if we look at vaccine hesitancy over the long term, it's never at rates like you're describing. It's in the you know, 10, 20% range, perhaps, um, depending on the vaccine sometimes, but overall. Um, so what would make a COVID vaccine less appealing to someone who might not have even been vaccine hesitant and now is adding their name to that list. Um, clearly, uh, this has been a strange time we're in, not just because it's a pandemic, but because of lots of disinformation, misinformation being uh, provided, often on social media, but also because of misinformation coming down from the top levels of uh, the government. And um, 
giving things names like Operation Warp Speed, uh, for some of us that's kind of like cool, uh, and we like Star Trek, and we think, wow, you know, we're really putting a lot of time and energy and effort into this uh, to make sure that we're going at a pandemic pace. But for others, it might be less comforting, and it might make them think, oh, we've cut corners. So the usual research that goes in a vaccine isn't going into these vaccines. Well, that's completely untrue. Or the uh, production and the quality controls on these vaccines aren't going to be like the traditional vaccines because it's at warp speed. Well, that is not true either. Um, or the research that it's based on is so new that we shouldn't trust it because, um, you know, what's this mRNA business? I've never heard of that. And uh, how can that be a viable way of vaccinating the population? Um, well, it turns out, though it seems new, it's actually been around for quite a while, and it's been researched uh, a longer time than people would think, not at warp speed necessarily. So I think there are a lot of what? preconceptions that make people uh, a little less comfortable at the times we're in, and I think the best we can do in the public health enterprise and in the, uh, the government policy enterprise across states and across uh, the federal government is to respond on a point-by-point -point basis to the concerns people have and allow them to be more comfortable with something that they may have started out uncomfortable with. Would the same hesitancy, you think, apply to, uh, apply to testing where you know, some segments of the population might think that, you know, if you give them, if you give people uh, access to, uh, to nasal swabs and testing that, that, that they would compile, uh, a, a D, you know, a, a complete DNA database on everyone they're testing? Yeah, those kinds of concerns go a little beyond, and I, I'm not sure I can even respond to those. Um, but... I understand where you're coming from because we're in times when people uh, read a lot on the internet and uh, get fed a lot of information and some of it's highly credible and some of it's less credible. Oh, and prisoners too. I had a question from a viewer uh, about prisoner, uh, uh, Vermont prisoners getting, um, uh, I don't know, what do you call it, first in line. Uh, do we have that big of an elderly prisoner population that they would uh, that they would uh, be like first in line for um, for vaccines yeah, so. and would this apply to our, our state prisoners also yeah so actually we haven't uh, filled out the entire scheme uh, and incorporated prisoners there but to more directly respond you would be absolutely uh, maybe astonished at the age of prisoners as well Though there is a stereotype of someone perhaps younger, um, there's actually been uh, parts of our prison system have actually had uh, more of a geriatric uh, component to them, trying to attend to the special sure. needs of prisoners as they age, especially though obviously these are those who have been in the system for a long time usually. Uh, so that is a, uh, a more contemporary concern that there are prisoners who may actually um, be older and because of their um, prior lives may not have the most exotic, not have the most um, wonderful uh, health index right now and have some chronic <laughs> diseases um, precipitated by earlier lifestyle behaviors. So um, we, we certainly still c care about them as well. Sounds like maybe Steve is equating 1B. He's still looking at 1B, which yeah. is no longer our strategy. Right. So, you know, we've, we've gotten rid of the 1B part of our vocabulary, and we're really doing an age banding and other conditions um, stratification here. So um, more to come on all of that as we uh, become more definite about each one. Thank you for the questions. Well, great. Be great. Thank you all very much. Okay. Well, thank you very much for tuning in. Um, I'll see some of you on Thursday night at 7 o'clock, 
and there will be a media briefing on uh, coronavirus on Friday. Thank you.